Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's event. I'm Dr. Pratik Thambe, chairperson for the Amogs Endocrinology Committee. A warm welcome to today's event, which is a continuation of our theme, Key Issues in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Before we start the scientific proceedings, I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude to the Amogs office bearers, our recently installed president, Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardeshi, our secretary, Dr. Sujata Dalvi, and I'd also like to start by expressing my gratitude to the ICOG office bearers, the chairperson of ICOG, Dr. Uday Thanawala, secretary of ICOG, Dr. Ashok Kumar, for granting us the ICOG credit points for this entire series, which has started during the time of the pandemic. And now we are continuing it thanks to the efforts of Science Integra team, as well as our academic partners, Torrent. Next slide, please. Can we go to the slides, Meena, where the chairpersons are being introduced? Yeah, we can skip this. Next. I take great pride and privilege in welcoming to this wonderful dais, Dr. Kiran Kurtakoti, the vice president of Amox. I think we'll need to update his slide because he is now the first vice president of Amox. In the past, he served amongst in so many different capacities, the chairperson of the MTP committee, chairperson for medical education, research and training, also served as the second joint secretary of amongst. And uniquely, he also has served as the chairperson for the Foxy MTP committee way back in 2009 to 11. He's been the organizing secretary and convener for so many conferences, and we look forward to one more conference next weekend, Yuva ART, which is being organized by the Pune Society. My gratitude to Dr. Parag Biniwale, the president of POGS, as well as the secretary, Dr. Ashish Kale, for inviting me. Hope to see all of you there in person very soon. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Next slide, please. It's my... I think Dr. Sujata Dalvi has just messaged that she'll be delayed a little bit, but we will introduce her formally. Thank you so much, ma'am, for gracing the occasion. Dr. Sujata Dalvi is currently the secretary of MOGS. She is a consultant OBGYN at several hospitals in Mumbai, Global, Saifi, Bhatia, St. Elizabeth, Rukshmani. She is an already clinical associate at the Narojivadi Maternity Hospital and the Jagjivan Ram Railway Hospital. She is also on the board of the Journal of OBGYN of India, the official Foxy Journal. And she is also an office bearer of the Mumbai OBGYN Society. Thank you so much, ma'am. And we look forward to seeing you in a little while. Next slide, please. Dr. Ajay Mane has recently been elected as the vice president of Foxy. He is a member of the National Inspection Monitoring Committee, PCP entity wing of the government of India through Foxy. He's a medical legal consultant since 18 years and uniquely he's provided his services free of cost to everybody in need. He personally has looked after so many of us in Maharashtra and helped to free all the machines which were erroneously sealed under the Draconian PCP Entity Act. Very recently, he has also been the in charge for the website of Amogs and now with Dr. Pardeshi sir, he is the second joint secretary of Amogs as well. He served as a past president of the Aurangabad Kubijivayan Society and we take great pride in welcoming him to the Amogs fraternity once again. Next slide, please. We have four very unique speakers and of course, they will be introduced by the chairpersons. But I quickly just want to mention Dr. Pardeshi sir has been working with us for years together, we know him as somebody who is a grassroots worker. He's worked very hard and he's come up the hard way just like me with no godfathers, with just academic excellence and distinction. Thank you, sir, for joining us. It was a fantastic ceremony in Aurangabad to see you being installed as the president of Amox. I hope to have a fantastic tenure under your leadership. Thank you again for accepting me as the endocrinology committee chair for a further two years. And I'm sure we will have a rocking tenure under your leadership. Dr. Vipin Chekar, my dear friend, is somebody who has stood by me for years together. And he has uniquely known me since almost 30 years. We were together in Vadia Hospital. He was my register, believe it or not. 
and since then our association has begun he is also served as the past president of the association of medico legal consultants of mumbai and he is going to speak on a very important topic today which is tackling maternal mortality in the hospital as well as on table dr lakshmi shrikhande is the chairperson elect of icog our association goes back almost two decades and she is somebody who served icog and foxy in many different positions and capacities today she is going to speak to us about hyperglycemia in pregnancy and last but not least we have dr archana patak who is a young and upcoming star from ranchi obijivan society and we take great pride in welcoming her to the amox platform and she is going to be addressing us later on about the utility of progesterone in clinical practice so now that i have spoken for 6 minutes okay i spoke one minute more than usual <laughs> i would like to hand over to the chairpersons and i request dr kiran kuttakoti sir yeah. please introduce our first speaker of the day dr rajendra singh pardeshi sir our beloved president of amox thank you sir for being here Thank you, Pratik. At the outset, thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, inviting me on this particular prestigious seminar. Uh, because this is the first seminar after Dr. Pardeshi sir has taken over as the president of Amox. So I think uh, you are you are doing uh, first among first every time you are achieving something new. So maximum number of webinars I guess should be credited to you. So thank you again. And uh, uh, Dr. Pardeshi, I bring greetings to you from Pune Society as well as from the Amox fraternity. for uh, such a wonderful uh, wonderful ceremony that we had in amox and uh, i often say that uh, apart from the bio data which dr pratik tambe has already read out about dr pardeshi dr pardeshi can be called as a ajat shatru and what is a ajat shatru ajat shatru is a person who is born without enemies i have hardly seen any single person talk anything negative about dr pardeshi and that's really a good quality which i have to take uh, uh, which everyone has to take and same thing about pratik too pratik also is uh, ajat shatru no everyone speaks so nicely of pratik so uh, so thank you for this particular uh, occasion and uh, welcome again dr archana ji because uh, uh, this is a amos platform and we love to be associated with all the other associations as well as people who are outside uh, maharashtra so thank you a really a power packed session for uh, today and i would request uh, dr pardeshi sir to get on with this topic uh, of uh, preventing pph which is again a very important thing because we know that because of this particular pph issue two of our fraternity member one of them had to met, uh, meet a tragic death and other of course uh, uh, was assaulted so i think very important topic from everyone's point of view so without much ado pardeshi sir please get on with your topic of carbetosin in pph or medical management of pph yeah sir you can share your screen your uh, put it on slide show and you can start the talk sir is it okay sir so you can hit from beginning yes correct sir. is it okay no sir you have to stop slide sharing agar ah. start slide sharing and put it on uh, uh, slide share mode full screen mode tumcha lap ha now it's okay yeah yeah it yes is. sir perfect yes sir okay thank you thank you so much डॉक्टर किरण कुरकोटे डॉक्टर प्रतीक तांबे एंड अमोक्स ऑफिस बेरस डॉक्टर प्रतीक तांबे इज अवर अकेडमिशियन यू कैन से एंड गूगल ऑफ अवर अमोक्स एंड ही इज वी आर वेरी हैप्पी टू कंटिन्यू एज अ चेयरपर्सन इंडोक्राइन कमिटी विथ दिस आई विश टू एक्सप्रेस माय थैंक्स टू अर्चना all other office bearers for joining on the platform of amox so to start with our talk pph i think pph is really still a contributing for the maternal mortality as you know because still in india maternal mortality the main cause is pph only and as you know the main cause of death worldwide also 
it's a blood loss more than 500 ml within 24 hours in vaginal delivery or more than 1000 after cesarean delivery all you must be knowing and the major cause of the both maternal mortality and morbidity in worldwide not only in india but worldwide is pph in adopting in developing country in developing country estimated mortality rate of 140000 per year that means maternal death every 4 minutes one maternal death every 4 minutes and it's a really alarming thing who estimates that of the 529000 maternal deaths occurring every year and 133000 or 25.7% of death take place in india and two third of these contributes to pph only still one good thing is that our maternal mortality rate is below 70 and maharashtra is 38% and we are proud of that and the efforts of our amogs and stalwarts like all you know our office bearers and all that we could reach this and we have to maintain this and i hope we should maintain it i think to up to single digit these are the four causes of pph mainly four t's are there tone trauma tissue and thrombi but tone contributes 70% that is atonic uterus and atonic uterus is the cause mainly we have to look after that the most common cause is uterine atony which results from poor contraction of the uterus after childbirth then what is the uterine atony it is defined as the failure of the uterus to contract adequately following delivery and it is the most common cause and these are the risk factors like multiple pregnancy induction of labor birth means related factors prolonged labor oxytocin augmentation deep anesthesia magnesium sulfate previous pph history obesity or age more than 35 years and many other causes also it is important to limit the amount of hemorrhage to the minimum possible level our goal should be like that and who suggests the active management of the third stage of labor let us see the pharmacotherapy for pph the administration of uterotonic medication soon after the delivery is an essential part of the active management of third stage of labor see the class and drugs oxytocin and its analogs contributes oxytocin and carbitocin oxytocin is still the first line drug ergotalkaloids ergonovin malate methyl ergonovin prostaglandins as you know carboprost mesoprostol and dinoprostol see this is the current treatment option to manage the pph as first line treatment as i told you oxytocin is there second line agent carboprost methyl ergonovin mesoprostol tranexamic acid this is now the molecule carbitocin carbitocin is an analog of oxytocin and its action similar to that of oxytocin it causes contraction of the uterus as i told you oxytocin is the first line of treatment suggested by all suggested by who also and carbitocin is a analog of oxytocin that's why why it is important in pph we are discussing see this is a mechanism of action of carbitocin carbitocin in selectively binds to oxytocin receptors and finally his acts due to his action it stimulates and the contractility will be reduced and uterus contracts let us see the pharmacodynamics on the postpartum uterus carbitocin is capable of increasing the rate and force of spontaneous uterine contractions onset of con- action of carbitocin is rapid after iv or im with a firm contraction being maintained within 2 minutes see it's very fast action is very fast and that is very important and it reduces the blood and then ultimately maternal mortality and morbidity a single dose of 100 microgram iv or im administered after delivery of the infant is sufficient to maintain the adic- adequate contraction and uterus contractility uterus should be contracted see these parameters absorption distribution and excretion 
after the intramuscular administration peak concentrations are reached after 30 minutes and the mean bioavailability is 77% it's a high bioavailability and detectable in breast milk in very small amount there are no side effects it's very small amount and excretion less than 1% of injected dose excretion unchanged by kidney that's why there are no side effects terminal elimination is half life 33 minutes after intravenous administration 55 minutes after intramuscular administration see these doses doses is very important in cesarean section 1 ml containing 100 microgram carbitocin and administer only by intravenous injection under adequate medical supervision in a hospital of course all are there even if in procedure anesthetists are there in hospital so we are monitoring continuously so it should be under medical supervision after vaginal delivery 1 ml containing 100 microgram carbitocin and administered by intravenous injection or intramuscular under adequate medical supervision for intravenous administration carbitocin must be administered slowly over 1 minute now let us see clinical evidence it's a heat stable carbitocin versus oxytocin in pph prevention let us see the trials this is the clinical evidence this is evidence based medicine it's a champion trial it's a really important trial as it's double bind non inferiority trial conducted in 20, 23 cities in 10 countries and around 30000 women with pph after birth and intervention is as i told you heat stable carbitocin 100 microgram im versus oxytocin at a dose of 10 units immediately uh, administered after vaginal birth and there are two primary outcomes proportion of women with blood loss of at least 500 ml or the use of additional eutrophication see these outcomes in primary also and secondary also heat stable carbitocin performs similarly to oxytocin in preventing blood loss of at least 500 ml or use of other eutrotonics agent this is important trial and now let us see carbitocin versus oxytocin in cesarean section with high risk of postpartum hemorrhage there are 102 women undergoing elective cesarean section and this is the two groups carbitocin group and control group with oxytocin with 20 in units in normal saline and these are the primary outcome evaluation of immediate hemodynamic effect of carbitocin and need for additional eutrotonic agents these are the secondary outcomes seen drop in hemoglobin level uterine tone uterine fundal state and diuresis and these are the result on maternal blood loss see these are the results less than 500 ml more than 1000 ml after cesarean section during cesarean section then after 2 hours after 12 hours and after 24 hours see uterine tone and position of the uterus fundus umbilical point after this study the single injection of carbitocin appears to be more effective than a continuous infusion of oxytocin to prevent pps with a similar hemodynamics profile and minor anti diuretic effect this study also proves this is the randomized control trial comparing carbitocin mesoprostol and oxytocin for the prevention of pps following an elective cesarean delivery primary outcomes occurrence of uterine atony necessitating additional eutrotonics see results are very important see blood loss bleeding as i told you previously same 500 to 1000 bleeding of 1000 ml and hemodynamics see in this additional eutrotonics were less frequently needed by patient treated with carbitocin carbitocin appears to be an attractive alternative to compare to oxytocin and mesoprostol for the prevention of atonic pps following cesarean delivery 
See this study, carbitocin versus oxytocin for PPH in patients with severe preeclampsia, a double blind randomized control trial in 60 women with severe preeclampsia. And this study shows, see all the carbitocin is as effective as oxytocin in preventing postpartum bleeding in women with severe preeclampsia with no alterations in hemodynamic station status and with few slides. Carbitocin versus oxytocin for PPH prevention. This is meta-analysis. Only in this study, there was no significant difference between carbitocin and oxytocin in blood loss in women undergoing vaginal delivery. See, what's the who opinion? WHO recommendations on the use of pitotonics for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. Carbitocin, see, carbitocin is recommended by WHO as an effective utrotonics in its 2018 guidelines. See, this is a heat stable carbitocin. WHO, even FIBO also recommended. These are the Cochrane reviews. Cochrane reviews, the Need for further utrotonics. And we're going to the caesarean, but for that are the gu guidelines by SOGC that carbitocin should be used for the prevention of PPH in elective caesarean sections. These are the SOGC guidelines in active management of third stage of liver prevention and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. As I told you, carbitocin as a bolus should be used instead of continuous oxytocin infusion in elect elective caesarean section for women delivering vaginally with one risk factor for PPH. Carbitocin 100 microgram intermensally decrease the need of further utrotonics. Then how, then let us see how carbitocin is better than oxytocin. It's a oxytocin analog only. But how it is better? Basically, oxytocin is a short half-life, 3 to 17 minutes, and carbitocin is long half-life, 40 minutes after IV injection, and fourfold longer eutrotonic activity than precludes the necessity of continuous infusion. Then continuous oxytocin, continuous infusion is required. And for carbitocin, single injection is effective. And Carbitocin, it reduces the need of additional eutrotonics. And important is that in oxytocin, it does not possess satisfactory real world efficacy, particularly in hot, low and middle income countries and regions. Storage temperature is like this. But carbitocin is promising alternative to oxytocin for prevention of people. It's stable at 30 degrees. Just see storage temperature and see it's stable at 30 degree. That is very important because still people they try oxytocin, but still in our rural area also, in PSCs also, it is not possible. Even if freeze is there, electricity problems are there. So I think carbitocin is very important. To summarize this, PPS still remains the cause, second leading cause of maternal morbidity and morbidity worldwide, not only in India, worldwide. Utrona atoni is the most common cause of PPH. Carbitocin is a long acting synthetic analog of oxytocin. Carbitocin is promising alternative to oxytocin. It should be used as first line for prevention of PPH, non inferior to oxytocin with single dose administration and new formulation with good stability at 30 degree temperature. Currently, licensed for active management of third stage of labor. It's a really good molecule as. In our scenario, still our uh, India, 60% population is rural area. And in rural area, we will advocate this molecule because of its stability up to 30 degree. So thank you. Thank you so much for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pratik, and for inviting me such an academic and practical webinar. Thank you very much, sir. I think as the president of AMOGS, your message is very clear that even though we have achieved one of the lowest maternal mortality, we've already exceeded the WHO and UNFPA goals. 
our aim should be to reduce maternal mortality as close to zero as possible we don't want any preventable deaths to occur in maharashtra under your leadership i think over the next two years thanks to your dynamic leadership and propagating this principle of administering carbetos in asap we will go a long way towards achieving that thank you so much sir for taking time out from your busy schedule thank you for being here again i want to thank you for including me in your team and allowing me to continue as the chairperson for a mox endocrinology committee for another two years for a second innings it's lovely to have you here on this platform we hope to see you more frequently again and we hope to do many more events under your leadership over the next two years thank, thank you sir you. thank you can i request dr ajay mane sir who has joined us just now we have introduced you formally already sir as the recently elected vice president of foxy and the second joint secretary of mogs requesting you to please introduce our next speaker of the day dr vipin chakar past president of aims great uh, at the outset i must convey my gratitude to my dear friend and my younger brother dr pratik tambe sir uh, who has given me the chance to be a part of his first webinar in uh, 2022 to 24 tenure and uh, thank you rajan singh pardi sir and uh, surya dadavi madam for uh, incorporating me in this team and this webinar so i am uh, introducing one the one of the greatest personalities uh, and uh, that is dr vipin chekar he is consultant gynecologist obstetrician ivf and fetal medicine consultant uh, pradha maternity and uh, medical nursing home Bahender East. He is an honorary consultant at Oakhead Hospital, Mira Road, and Pandit Bhimsen Joshi Road, Nalai, Bahender West. Uh, he is a student of final year LLB three, law student, Mumbai University. As of me also, I'm in mean third year student. <coughs> he is past president IMA, MBHY, AMC, BMA, and past vice president IMA MS. He is expertised in MTP and married. Uh, divorcee and high risk of BJN medical legal problems related to MTP and uh, Foxo Act uh, arrest and bail basically uh, which is very important uh, for a doctor uh, women rights and laws and police station visits uh, that is the most important thing he is having uh, nowadays because uh, it carries a different uh, uh, avenue and uh, expertise to deal with the police uh, station and the police. Uh, people so i welcome you uh, vipin sir and i request you to kindly proceed with your uh, lecture thank you sir and his topic is death on the table how to uh, declare how to deal with the relatives and how to deal with the uh, position at that moment is very much important for everybody Good morning. I mean, sir. Good afternoon, sir. sir. Okay, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So at the outset, uh, thank you, Amox Pradeshi sir and uh, Sujata Dalvi madam, ICUG Thanawala sir and OB of ICUG, Chairperson Kiran sir and Manne sir, Pratik Tambe sir, Scientific Integrant. All right. My topic today basically is dealing with death. What next, actually? so the first most important thing is we should not panic our adrenal levels really go high uh, it is the panic 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 button that you know makes us lose our self control makes us lose our mind and infiltrates or filtrates uh, words in our mouth which are not to be spoken the anger that exists and the other factors that are so you need to inform the family members about the sudden death of their loved one it's a very highly stressful experience for the treating doctors and breaking the bad news to the bereaved family needs special skill on part of the clinicians uh, this is most important for the younger generation that is there who have got a younger blood and uh, who are very aggressive in nature and that's where uh, skillness and the coolness of the seniors when called uh, when faced with the experience of death in the hospital or on the ot table is what is going to count 
unfortunately there is very little guidance on the approach of this very sensitive matter and uh, doctors routinely depend on their own experience rather than any training received in the medical school a well trained doctor in this field will be in a better position to handle the daunting task of breaking the bad news and it's obviously a high time to include this in the curriculum that is there now patient that is there may be brought dead how are you going to declare dead outside the hospital what it also depends on the facility of the hospital and police information i'll take these three questions in the question answer session so you could ask me each and everything on this and you know this can go on for hours as to how you are going to declare the death about the facility and how the police is to be informed when it has to be informed what are the precautions that need to be taken so we are always aware when the death is going to occur the patient may be critically ill or it may be sudden death that is there you need to give first aid and if you are a small institute shift the patient to a higher institute go along with the patient don't drive your car behind the patient sit with the patient in the ambulance take hold of a sister carry your resuscitative uh, equipment that is there and always always try to shift the patient in a cardiac ambulance is going to cost you 5 6000 rupees let the money go from your pocket and do not create blunders of sending the patient or transferring the patient even to the next door patient now how are you going to have an initial contact with the family you know once the patient is there in the icu uh, as an emergency we can summon the family members and uh, most of the time what happens is when there is an emergency there is nobody around so you need to ensure that there is one relative that is there outside continuously a senior member of the healthcare team should be called should call the family members do not ask the sisters to call the family members always the senior physician who's there or the senior intensivist is there should do the honors of this thing that is there you need to inform that the patient has become ill suddenly and initiation a prompt treatment incorporates and all they are well informed we have the consent forms that are there and uh, how we are going to counsel the patient and how the patient is going to progress all that thing that is there family members should be asked to come to the hospital immediately if the patient is already dead care should be taken not to break the news on the telephone unless the family members live a long distance away mind you so very important if the death is expected simply break the news to anyone who receives the phone and note down the person's identity and his or her relation to the deceased if we are to break the sad news over the phone make sure that somewhere is around with the person who is going to receive it receiving the family family members in the icu a relatively confident member of the healthcare team should receive the relatives at the icu and confirm their identity and relation to the patient of course in a corporate setup today we know who the relatives are we have a separate counseling room that is there or in the hospital a special team that is there or the doctor that is there should take this into consideration you need to prefer to talk to somebody who is familiar to the healthcare team already a comfortably furnished room should be available near the icu to talk to the relatives try to limit the discussions to only one or two members of the family always identify the potential threat in that group that is there in case you are faced with a mob once the death occurs identify one or two persons call in a few seniors at that particular moment of counseling when you are going to break the news to the patient of death to the patient handling of the family members will differ if the patient is already dead or if the patient is alive and res- receiving resuscitation now when the patient is alive prepare the relatives for the possibility of death that's again relatively repeated counseling uh, repeated counseling repeated counseling 95% of the times helps you to curtail the death scenario that is there or to avoid the uh, repercussions of the death once they occur so the relatives need to be primed and the senior physician should always be in touch once faced with this critically ill patients and this it is very stupid on part of the private practitioners not the corporate the private practitioners to always say patient is okay patient is okay patient is a kuch nahi hoga and suddenly the patient deteriorates patient should always be primed if the issue is good or it is bad and he or she should be available and should be aware that the relative should be aware of the consequences of maternal mortality and the pph or any other complications that take place a relatively senior and confident clinician should introduce himself first and then begin the talk for sure the for shadow the bad news i am sorry but i have bad news explain the relatives how well the patient was doing earlier any sudden deterioration clinician should explain the possible reasons of sudden deterioration he should be very patient to encourage the family members to ask questions and express feelings and should be most able to answer them this will help a build a sense of trust and good rapport with the family members 
one of the relative who is relatively confident and well versed with the hospital setup should be given an opportunity to witness the ongoing resuscitation in the icu now this is again a very debatable topic whether you should have one relative there once a resuscitating and the hospital should also be in such a frame of mind to handle such sort of an emergency that in case the relative is there we are not using any abrupt words that are there we are not using abusive language we are not hyper uh, we are not screaming on the sisters and lot of other things that go on uh, once we are faced with the adrenaline rush once the, the resuscitation is going on the senior most clinician in the team should explain the resuscitation procedure procedure and should the signs of life and should show the signs of life like spontaneous breathing breathing or heartbeat in the cardiac monitor limb movements etc the sincere words of this witness will simply help the relatives to confirm that everything possible is being done then the relative should be taken back to the discussion room and the senior clinician to explain the prognosis and chances of survival a priest or any other spiritual counselor should be allowed to offer final prayer if the relatives wish so the staff should keep the family informed with frequent updates on the progress of the resuscitation access to the telephone should be provided for the relatives so that they communicate with the other family members these steps will give the family ample amount of time to prepare themselves mentally for the most inevitable now how do you inform the family about the death and finally if the resuscitation is not successful the senior clinician who is responsible for the patient should sit with the relatives and break the bad news try to call a group of doctors to be there for medical and emotional support again as earlier try to engage only one or two members of the family practical tip always ensure one spokesperson from the doctor side to explain about the death of the patient uh when facing with a mob once comes we'll take it out the end when the question and answer friends and others should be asked to wait outside the room prefer talking to the same person who has been briefed about the patient's critical illness earlier it's always easier to converse and convince a familiar person than a stranger in the end once faced with a mob or something you're always going to have a lot of strangers moreover it will be a lot wise easier to break the sad news to the person who is quite aware of the ongoing treatment and the patient's problem rather than to a totally new person use plays english terms like he is dead or died rather than euphemisms like he passed away or left us no more etc this will help to avoid the risk of misinterpretations now how do you facilitate the grief reaction is having after having announced the bad news the doctor's next duty is to help the relatives go through the process of grief encourage the relatives to express the feelings like crying loudly or sobbing encourage them to talk about the patient's illness and if they open up try to explain the efforts taken to save them and the inevitable outcome remaining silent with physical touch like placing the hand on the sobbing person's hand or the hand may be tried depending upon the situation and ethnic background appreciating the efforts taken by the relatives to get the patient treated may help them to come out with a sense of guilt or self blame convince them again that there has been no shortage of efforts either from the healthcare team or from the relatives in certain cases especially when the disease has been uh, in deep coma explain them how peaceful the death was this would help to convince them that the beloved one did not suffer much such reassurances also reduce guilt feelings some amounts of religious philosophy like ultimately everything depends on god's wish or life span being over as per god's calculation etc may help to console the bereaved relatives and again this depends again on the ethnicity and religious in the background do not respond or argue with the relatives if they blame or comment on the healthcare team of the hospital they will realize their mistake and surely apologize when the emotions settle down whenever there is a medical legal implications or other situations where a medical autopsy may be needed as certain the cause of death relatives should be informed about the possible autopsy well in advance arrange for viewing the body of the deceased now before allowing the relatives to view the body make it more presentable cover the body with proper bed clothes disconnect all life supports like endotracheal tube cardiac monitors ventilators etc wipe the face neatly to clean blood and other secretions clean the jelly on the chest used for dc shock avoid emotionally charged or labile relatives viewing body as they themselves may collapse inside the icu <clears throat> when the patient is already dead before the arrival of the relatives receive the relatives at the icu as described earlier and confirm their identity make them seated in a well furnished room as described earlier again the relative is known to the healthcare team should be preferred a relatively senior and confident clinician should introduce himself first and then begin the talk inform few reliable colleagues to be ready and stand by if the need arises prepare the relatives with the foreshadow of the bad news i'm sorry but i have bad news break the sad news in a simple language and avoid using euphemism as mentioned earlier facilitate the grief reaction as described earlier and help the family members to view the deceased 
helping the relatives to go through the official formalities now this is also another big daunting task for the relatives once the death has occurred one of the hospital staff should assist the relatives in completing the formalities like filling the details of the deceased so as to get a legal death certificate etc if an autopsy is needed guide the relatives of the various procedures and finally ensure smooth and timely handling of the body of deceased along with valuables and personal belongings to add to it you will have to forego the hospital bill if the hospital bill is not paid and should be prepared to release the body to the relatives now if there is a death in the hospital basic dictum never declare immediately gather your strength gather your staff once the death has occurred either in the ot table or wherever it is you should have a joint meeting of the staff who is present on duty the doctor who is present on duty the physician the operating physician as to what statement is to be given to the relatives and there has to be one statement and the death occurs in the ot table be be very sure to ensure that there are no expiry drugs on the in the operation theater so never declare immediately staff should be alert prime relatives every 15 minutes the rmo and consultant should do what their best at now if you are anticipating a death or a mob or some sort of a violence that is there you should inform the police well in advance you should call the police after the death and call while declaring the death now these are all blunt and blank statements that are there you will have to take each statement each sentence of this in purview of the particular case that you are handling so the particular case that is being handled has to be handled in the way the whole scenario is all patients may not accept death violence is occurring at a particular period of time which may not be acceptable so you should be geared up to handle and handle violence you should be geared up to handle the police you should be geared up to handle the relatives that are there and after death is declared you need to have the cause of death again whether a post mortem is needed a post mortem is not debate is not needed is another topic of discussion case papers have to be complete right up to the point that is there ot and ward medicines expiry if the patient has expired in the ward ensure that there are no expiry medicines kept including the rails tube that is there one of the doctors here was attacked physically and physically abused because the child died and the relative was a patrakar and he by chance stumbled upon patient ke baju mein jo rt ka tube tha which was expired that was there and that was the thing which created a lot of furor and he still paying for it deeply through his practice for that particular case that happened so do not take lightly any expiry medicines that are there in your ward ensure a proper checklist system in your hospital to ensure there are no expiry dates expiry medicines in your hospital for the patients and relatives you need to talk stop and approach of to the mob and how to handle the mob is another big thing so i will end my talk here and i have just rushed you through the general concepts of death how it is there how it has to be handled how you are going to what you call handle the mob so i think we we'll take on questions which may be lot of things which people may be wondering how to handle uh, death in some particular situations that are there thank you yeah thank you uh, thank you sir you have covered almost all points uh, two points uh, i just again uh, uh, tell you uh, for the so people who are listening uh, consent of all situations and counseling and counseling and counseling they are the two answers for each and every situation which is very important in this situation as uh, we been sir uh, told us sir thank you very much it was very nice lecture. and thank, thank you, you pratik bhai thank you dr vipin i think you handled that topic so beautifully like an express train in a very short time you gave us so many different key practice points especially i liked your points about how you break the news slowly not in a sudden fashion and to the person who is most understanding who has been receiving news about the progress of the patient and another key point which you mentioned is that you try and mobilize your resources get your staff ready get a group of doctors ready who are there to be able to tackle in case there are any questions or there is a mob violence i think these are very important practice points in private practice especially where all of us are competing with each other and finally when there is an actually issue 
we don't come to each other's help that's the sad scenario today but this is one particular situation when you have a death in obj one practice where all of us need to be united and we need to be able to tackle the situation as a team i think that's a very important practice point and a take away message for all of us who are listening in well one last new... point yes sir yeah one last point which i want to add is with voluminous practice and with voluminous workload we are bound to have complications that are there we are bound to have lot of people jealous factors that are there we are bound to have lot of politicians coming to you we are lot of bound to have lot of other uh, media people coming to you and you know creating a furor it's an earnest request that you meet the senior pi of your local police station introduce yourself to him ensure you are at very good terms with him in whatever best way you can uh, you know handle relationship with these officers and what one of my friends does is he sends a good morning message to all the officers including me uh, of a broadcast list of 200 police officers all of mumbai and maharashtra thane which i have and maybe every four day i send a whatsapp message how are you long time did not see maybe if i'm tied up after 10 days or something so this helps in keeping in touch with these people that is there and once faced with the violence once faced with the issue that is there he will pick up the phone at that odd uh, odd god mr and he will ensure that somebody comes to your police station immediately you know dialing 100 is one of the best ways to record a police complaint and it is an honest request take a message to all of you that in case faced with this thing you please dial 100 let the call be recorded and then call the senior police officer of your local area and tell him what that uh, uh, problem is and he will ensure that uh, things are uh, what you call under control and he will ensure that you get time to fill in your paperwork they will not be in a hurry and he will also take care of your interest and ensure that things go on smoothly this is one strong point which i have been working with the police people for the last 5 years and uh, it's just a matter of respect which they also feel that we have a doctor friend who has given us a respect at the same time we are afraid thinking that uh, uh, how can we approach them but a simple approach calling them to your association uh, what you call uh, programs that are there felicitating some officer that is there the celebrating something calling one particular officer of his uh, unit that is there uh, going to the local police station with a bunch of few uh, friends and giving them a sensitization talk at 9 pm every night there is a briefing twice or thrice in a week of the police officer giving a sort of uh, on particular talk to all the officers in the police station so you could take that opportunity go at there get into the shantata committee and with so many deaths occurring today and each patient being a potential litigant i think it's time we change our approach to the police station and to the whole uh, issue that we are facing today thank you thank you sir i think words of wisdom and we will of course have you again at another point maybe a few months later to talk about more difficult issues thank you so much for sparing your precious time at present i don't see any questions from the audience so we will move to the next speaker dr lakshmi shrikande has been waiting very patiently requesting meenal to please share her cv there is one uh, question which i put to you not sir yeah that question is not relevant meenal because we are talking about deaths and the question is about patient discharge so dead patients don't get discharge it is live patients who get discharge so that question is not really relevant can we please have the cv of dr lakshmi shrikande requesting dr ajay mane sir to please do the honors and introduce dr lakshmi sir yes great i am here again and again introducing one of the best personalities from maharashtra dr lakshmi shrikande ma'am Uh, she is a chairperson elect icog indian college of obstetrics and gynecology the most prestigious and academic wing of oxy a national corresponding editor journal of obgy that is jogi national corresponding secretary association of medical women india she is a founder patron and president of isopar vidarbha chapter uh, 2019 to 21 she is a chairperson ims education committee 2123 she is a president Association of Medical Women Nagpur uh, AMWN 2124 uh, she has uh, been awarded as a Nagpur Ratna award at the hands of union minister sri nitin jagadkar sir uh, she is uh, she has been received uh, bharat excellence award for women health received mehru dara hansotia best committee award for her work as the chairperson in hiv aids committee foxy 7 to 9 
then uh, received appreciation letter from maharashtra government for her work in the field of save the girl child senior vice president foxy in 2012 president minerva society nagpur 16 to 18 president nagpur vision society 56 delivered 11 orations and 450 guest lectures i think more than that she has given less uh, number here <laughs> publications 30 national and 11 uh, international and she has sensitized to like boys and girls on adults and health issue uh, a great personality from nagpur uh, very sweet as uh, all santras and ever fresh and uh, uh, good academician and dr lakshmi srikanth please and the appropriate person to speak about high blood sugar in pregnancy <laughs> coming from the city of oranges <laughs> thank you thank you so much ajay for your generous introduction and heartiest congratulations for getting elected as a vice president of foxy and i also would like to congratulate dr rajendra singh pardesi for getting now installed as president of amox pratik my slides are visible i am audible yes ma'am you just need yeah. to go full screen yeah Yeah, perfect. And, yeah. Great. So the topic given to me by Pratik is hyperglycemia in pregnancy. So whenever we are talking of hyperglycemia in pregnancy, it can be pre-existing diabetes or it can be gestational diabetes. Pre-existing can be type one or type two diabetes, and gestational diabetes can be pre-existing diabetes or it can be a case of true GDM. So now let us see what I mean by pre-existing diabetes and what do I mean by GD. Pre-existing diabetes is diagnosed before the start of pregnancy or hyperglycemia, which is diagnosed for the first time in pregnancy. It meets WHO criteria for diabetes mellitus in a non-pregnant state, and it may occur any time during pregnancy, including the first trimester. Gestational diabetes mellitus. in two sense is hyperglycemia during pregnancy that is not diabetes it is hyperglycemia diagnosed for the first time during pregnancy and it may occur just it may occur any time during pregnancy but it is most likely after 24 weeks of pregnancy now prevalence we say that india is the diabetes capital of the world 22 million women between 20 to 39 years they have diabetes this is 2010 2010 data and it was expected to rise by 20% in the next 10 years 54 million women with impaired glucose tolerance or pre diabetes they have the potential to develop gdm if they become pregnant the prevalence of gdm in india varies from 3.8 to 21% in different parts of the country depending on the geographical locations and diagnostic methods used and it has been found to be more prevalent in urban areas than in rural areas so in my presentation i am going to cover the definition screening how to diagnose the antenatal intranatal postnatal management and prevention pathophysiology i will not go into the detail you all know that insulin resistance due to placental secretion of anti insulin hormones maternal hepatic glucose production increases in pregnancy and pancreatic beta cell dysfunction all these can lead to gestational diabetes mellitus now when we say gdm let us understand the difference between a screening test and a diagnostic test when we say screening remember the purpose of screening is to identify or symptomatic individuals with a high probability of having or developing a specific disease so for gdm we do screening now whom to screen for gdm universal screening appears to be the optimum approach as the indian women have 11 fold increased risk of developing glucose intolerance during pregnancy compared to caucasian women so now when we know it has to be screened now which screening method so i am not going to speak about other screening methods as we all follow the dipsy criteria when it comes to screening of gdm in india this is a one step approach and this has been endorsed by government of india on 14th march 2007 government of india issued the instructions 
that universal screening of glucose intolerance during pregnancy is mandatory and the order recommends that all women should be screened between 24 and 28 weeks of gestation with two hour single dose that is 75 gram oral glucose now how to do it because it has to be done correctly 75 gram of glucose should be given with 300 ml of water it is irrespective of last meal it should be ingested within 5 to 10 minutes the whole 300 ml blood glucose should be measured after 2 hours and if the woman vomits within 30 minutes of the intake of this solution you have to repeat the test on the next day now once we do the test we should know how to interpret it so this is the interpretation of the dipsy test if values comes more than 200 diabetes between 140 to 199 it is gestational diabetes 120 to 39 it is gestational glucose intolerance and if it is less than 120 it is normal why we all are following dipsy criterias and now not the other criterias because it is simple feasible convenient economical and acceptable in indian scenario in india we all know women have to travel long distances for checkup hence this non fasting single test becomes more acceptable to our pregnant woman we all also know that our population is diverse and variable and hence international criterias on our indian population may not be practical and feasible so without confusing you dipsy criteria is endorsed by government of india and we all have to follow it screening for gdm is mandatory in india so when should it be done it should be done at first booking whenever she comes to you for first internet uh, first antenatal visit it is endorsed by both government of india and dipsy at 24 to 28 weeks again by both gio and dipsy at 32 to 34 weeks is recommended by dipsy now why we all are talking so much about gdm why screen why diagnose and why treat because identifying women with gdm is important because appropriate therapy can decrease maternal and fetal morbidity and it can prevent two generations from developing diabetes in the future this is the whole list of maternal problems in the early pregnancy it can end up with spontaneous miscarriage this woman is more prone to develop preeclampsia gestational hypertension uti macrosomia hydramnios during delivery again she can face a host of problems in the form of preterm birth instrumental delivery traumatic delivery more chances of cesarean section postpartum infections pph increased morbidity and maternal mortality puerperium she has more chances of infections and lactation failure and long term postpartum she is more prone for weight retention gdm in subsequent pregnancy and she is more prone for developing diabetes later in the life this is a list of fetal problems the fetus this woman can end up with stillbirth neonatal uh, deaths this child can end up with congenital malformations there can be problems in the form of shoulder dis uh, shoulder dystocia respiratory distress syndrome cardiomyopathy hypoglycemia hyperbilirubinemia and hypocalcemia so now we know the list of problems for both mother and the child we also know whom to screen how to screen and how to interpret now you have diagnosed that this particular woman is having gda now what next so the outline for gda management the primary strategy is dietary changes and exercise if uncontrolled hypoglycemia remains with lifestyle change then insulin is the first line therapy and metformin can be used depending on your individual circumstances with that patient so what are the management issues when we are talking of gda don't focus only on insulin or metformin it is patient education patient education and patient education also she you have to motivate her then comes medical nutrition therapy pharmacological therapy you have to tell her about the glycemic monitoring 
you have to do proper fetal monitoring you have to plan for delivery and you also have to take appropriate postpartum care so now let us start with the nutrition therapy nutrition counseling ideally should be done by registered dietitian i know in small setups usually we don't have a separate dietitian you can refer them there or if you are practicing in a rural area you have to take the responsibility to do this nutrition counseling you have to educate her about healthy diet she has to replace high glycemic index foods with low glycemic index foods to reduce need for insulin initiation you have to discuss appropriate weight gain and healthy lifestyle interventions throughout pregnancy so what are the goals when you are initiating medical nutrition therapy your therapeutic goals are adequate nutrition adequate weight gain you have to prevent ketosis and prevention of postprandial hyperglycemia this is the individual diet plan based on the level of activity and bmi you all can take screenshot if she is having sedentary work moderate work heavy work this is the energy requirement and this is the weight category if she is underweight normal weight overweight obese what should be the energy requirement according to her weight in general if you are counseling then she should have 30 kilo calorie per kg that is the normal weight woman 24 kilo calorie per kg if she is overweight and 12 kilo uh, calorie per kg if she is morbidly obese diet should contain 50% complex carbohydrates 20% protein and 25 to 30% fat usually three meal regimen in between two snacks are allowed with breakfast 25% of the total intake lunch should contain 30% of the total intake and dinner 30% unless contraindicated physical activity should be included in a pregnant woman's daily regimen regular moderate intensity physical activity can help to reduce glucose levels in patients with gdm other appropriate forms of exercise during pregnancy like cardiovascular training with weight bearing which is limited to the upper body to avoid mechanical stress on the abdominal region should be encouraged and this is the target weight gain if she is having gdm if she is underweight 12.5 to 18 kg weight gain should be your target if she is normal weight 11.5 to 16 kg if she is overweight the total weight gain target is 7 to 11.5 kg and if she is obese total weight gain target is 5 to 9 kg now insulin is the first line of therapy so how to start insulin during pregnancy we at major cities we have the advantage of having endocrinologist and we always involve endocrinologist in our team when we think that this case of gdm needs insulin therapy about 50% of women initially treated with diet alone will require insulin therapy insulin management has to be individualized but most pregnant women require about 0.7 units per kg daily two thirds of this insulin is administered in the morning and one third is administered in the evening with a 1 is to 2 ratio of short to intermediate acting insulin this is the rough guide how it can help you during 1 to 13 weeks it is 0.7 unit per kg for between 14 to 26 weeks it is 0.8 unit per kg 27 to 37 weeks it is 0.9 unit per kg of weight 38 weeks to delivery it is usually 1 unit per kg of body weight postpartum and lactation this insulin requirement drops and it drops to roughly 0.5 units per kg of body weight so this is the rough and a very simple guide when you are starting your patient on insulin therapy that 50% basal insulin is given at bedtime monitor fasting glucose if it is more than 90 then you have to increase your basal insulin by 2 to 4 units you can give 50% bolus divided into 3 doses monitor one or two hour postprandial sugar and if your average two hour postprandial is more than 120 or average one hour postprandial is more than 140 you have to increase the postprandial insulin dose by 2 to 4 units so this is rough guide if you are managing your own insulin 
during GDM in the patient. So how to give insulin? I have already explained to you. There are insulin and insulin analogs available in the market. These are the insulin injection sites. Many women, they have to inject themselves and you can educate them about rotating the injection site. They should not inject on the sore areas or bruises. They develop rash or any problem. They should report it to doctor and tell them not to inject insulin over stretch marks. So this is the chart how to monitor these patients. Remember, when you are starting your patient on insulin, don't forget about hypoglycemia because any pregnant woman on insulin can develop hypoglycemia at any time. What is hypoglycemia? It is when blood glucose level drops to less than 70 and it is very important to recognize the symptoms of hypoglycemia and treat immediately. Not only doctors, but you have to explain and educate this to the patient and her immediate relatives as well. So how to recognize hypoglycemia? The early symptoms uh, are tremors, sweating, palpitation, easy fatigability, headache, mood changes, irritability. Severe, if it is left undiagnosed, patient can end up with confusion, abnormal behavior, visual disturbances, and the uncommon symptoms of hypoglycemia are seizures and loss of consciousness. So how to manage hypoglycemia? You have to tell her to take Three teaspoons of glucose powder, usually they all have in their household, dissolved in a glass of water. If glucose is not available, take her to take six teaspoons of sugar in a glass of water, fruit juice, honey or anything which is sweet. After taking oral glucose, she must take rest and avoid any physical activity. 15 minutes after taking glucose, she must eat one chapati with vegetable, rice, milk, fruit, whatever is available. If hypoglycemia continues, repeat same amount of glucose and weight. If pregnant woman develops more than one episode of hypoglycemia in a day, she has to consult the doctor immediately. Now, what is the status of oral hypoglycemic agents? Metformin, if you are starting, remember it is insulin sensitizer, should be given with a meal. Start at a gradually increasing dose, 500 mg once or twice daily with food. The maximum dose which you can give is 2 gram per day. And they, uh, up till now, no teratogenic risk has been demonstrated. It is a category B drug, but it is not FDA approved for use in pregnancy. This is the comparison between metformin and glycobride. And we have more studies on use of metformin during pregnancy as compared to glycobride. Now, how to monitor whatever you are giving, whether medical nutrition therapy, oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin. This pregnant woman has to monitor four times, that is the self-monitoring has to be done. One is fasting and three, she has to do one and a half hour postprandial, that is after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner. After achieving target level, lab monitoring till 28 weeks is once in a month, she should go to the lab and check her blood sugar levels. Between 28 to 32 weeks, the lab checkup frequency is once in two weeks. More than 32 weeks, the lab, check lab checkup has to be done once in a week. But along with this, don't forget to monitor other parameters in the form of fundus examination and microalbuminuria. So what are the glycemic targets? Because once you are telling her to self-monitor, you have to tell her what are the targets. The mean plasma glucose target is 105. I have simplified it for you. Fasting, 90 and postprandial, 120. Mean plasma glucose should never go below 86. So any woman you have diagnosed with GDM, start with MNT. Wait for two weeks. After two weeks, do the test again. If it is less than 120, continue MNT and physical exercise. If it is more than 120, you have to start the regimen, either insulin or oral, oral agents. Now, how to monitor her during pregnancy? Remember, she is a case of uh, precious pregnancy. She is more prone for various complications. So, first trimester, second trimester and third trimester, apart from your regular screening, this woman needs more attention on the dating scan, nuchal translucency, your double marker, uterine artery doppler, 
you can predict preeclampsia in the first trimester itself second trimester pay attention to the anomaly scan quadruple marker do fetal echo at 22 weeks of gestation and third trimester you have to monitor the fetal growth religiously for fetal monitoring you have to do baseline ultrasound whenever she comes to you at 18 to 22 weeks i have already emphasized that for detailed anomaly scan and fetal echo should be done 26 weeks onwards you have to monitor the fetus for growth and liquor volume so this is the chart that how you should monitor this patient during labor now when you have monitored when to deliver this lady with a gdm the figo recommendations are that you have to allow this pregnancy to continue up to 38 to 39 weeks of gestation but again it is your individual approach you have to see the risk factors and if everything is okay allow it to continue up to 38 to 39 weeks and if at this time the weight is less than 3.8 kg but there is poor control poor compliance previous stillbirth history if these are not there you can safely continue up to 40 to 41 weeks if the birth weight is between 3.8 to 4 kg that is large for gestational age and if she is giving you history of poor control of sugar poor compliance history of previous stillbirth history of previous vascular diseases you have to induce labor at 38 to 39 weeks of gestation if the weight at this time is more than 4 kg you have to offer elective cesarean delivery to this lady now you have to take certain special precautions during labor pregnant women with gdm on medical management they definitely require glucose monitoring by glucometer the morning dose of insulin or metformin should be withheld on the day of induction of labor and she should be started on two hourly monitoring of blood sugar IV infusion with normal saline to be started and regular insulin to be added according to the blood sugar levels as per given in this chart and this is according to the ministry of health and family family welfare that you have to follow this insulin and normal saline infusion during labor of course during first stage of labor you have to prevent hypoglycemia you have to do uh, ctgs you have to monitor and the target blood glucose is 80 to 120 if she goes into spontaneous labor in patients of hypoglycemia in pregnancy who are on oral anti diabetics again you have to do frequent monitoring and target is 80 to 120 during second stage of labor you have to do controlled arf anticipate shoulder dystocia assisted vaginal delivery might be required and neonatologist or a trained person to resuscitate the unit should be available at the time of delivery third stage of course it is active management of third stage and you have to watch out for traumatic or postpartum hemorrhage after the delivery of delivery is over so this is the insulin management during labor and delivery but don't forget that immediately after delivery you have to monitor the newborn for hypoglycemia and you should start early breastfeeding as soon as it is possible now don't forget to monitor these patients in the postpartum period if this woman was on mnt then cease blood glucose monitoring immediately after delivery give her regular postnatal care and do ogtt after 6 weeks postpartum if she was on oral hypoglycemic agents then in these cases also glucose tolerance normalizes immediately after delivery so stop giving her these medications but continue preprandial monitoring qid for 24 hours if this preprandial sugar is between 72 to 126 discontinue monitoring if it is less than 72 or more than 126 you have to seek medical review and continue monitoring 1 to 8% may continue to be glucose intolerance and they need oral hypoglycemic agents to be continued and you can decide but metformin is safe during lactation if she was on insulin then she needs preprandial glucose monitoring qid for 24 hours 
If glucose levels are more than 126, she needs medical review and start of oral agents. Insulin therapy is usually not indicated unless marked fasting hyperglycemia that is more than 200 is present. Now, what are the risk factors for persistent diabetes? If pregnancy fasting glucose levels was greater than or equal to 126, if your diagnosis GDM during the first trimester, and if she's giving you a history of GDM without documented normal glucose tolerance outside of pregnancy. So how to monitor for persistent diabetes? It is recommended that OGTT at six weeks postpartum should be done to screen for persistent diabetes, recommend life long screening for diabetes every three years and early glucose monitoring in future pregnancy. Breastfeeding should be encouraged immediately after delivery in order to avoid neonatal hypoglycemia to, and it should be continued for at least three to four months postpartum in order to prevent childhood obesity and this early initiation also reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes and hypertension in the mother. Contraception, don't forget to give the contraception counseling. Basically, Barrier, long-acting reversible contraception, POPs, DMPA, all these first three are safe during, uh, pre during GDM. Of course, COC implants rings are contraindicated only if she is having a macrovascular disease. Now, can we prevent GDM? In women who are at high risk for GDM, based on pre-existing risk factors, Nutrition counseling should be provided on healthy eating, prevention of excessive gestational weight gain in early pregnancy, ideally before 15 weeks of gestation to reduce. We can reduce, but we can't pre uh, prevent to reduce the chances of developing GTM. So friends, the key points from my presentation is that universal screening is mandatory. You have to test twice during first antenatal visit, again at 24 to 28 weeks, but DIPSI recommends third screening between 32 to 34 weeks. It is a single step, 75 gram, two hour OGTT, which we have to do. Pregnant women who are testing positive, that is two hour OGTT is more than 140 is taken as positive. They should be started with MNT, wait for two weeks. After two weeks, again, repeat the test. And if this is more than 120, you have to start either insulin or metformin. Early delivery with administration of prophylactic corticosteroid therapy for fetal lung maturity should be planned only and only if it is uncontrolled blood sugar or if there is any other obstetric indication. Otherwise, you can safely continue these pregnancies up to 38 to 39 weeks of pregnancy. Vaginal delivery is definitely preferred. LSCS should be offered only and only for obstetric indications or if fetal weight is more than 4 kg. Neonatal monitoring should be done for hypoglycemia and other complications. Postpartum evaluation of glycemic status should be done after 6 weeks of delivery. Friends, don't forget to emphasize and re-emphasize to this woman that about 50% of women with GDM, they go on to develop type 2 diabetes later in life. Pregnant women with GDM and their offspring are at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes mellitus and they should be counseled for healthy lifestyle and behavior, particularly the role of diabetes and exercise. I am just, uh, this is my last slide, that preconception recommendations. Because many of us, we are doing infertility practice, so we get a chance to see these women in the preconception period. More and more couples are aware and many of them, they are coming to us by choice for preconception counseling. So remember, if they come to you and she is a case of pre-existing diabetes and she is coming to you for a preconception counseling, have a multidisciplinary approach and see to it that her sugar levels are controlled. But apart from focusing only on glycemic targets, standard preconception care should be augmented and she should uh, see to it that she is having appropriate weight at the time of preconception, that is before becoming pregnant. Women with pre-existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes who are planning pregnancy or who have become pregnant 
they should be counseled on the risk of development or an or progression of diabetic retinopathy so friends this is the life cycle of a woman from pregnancy the, to the child to the school going to the adolescent and again to the pregnant woman so this is the health across the life cycle and if we can take proper care of gdm in this pregnancy we are taking care of coming two generations for her so thank you thank you so much for your patient care thank you madam as i said earlier you are a uh, very uh, typical and pure academician so you left no corner uh, untold or unturned rather so i don't have any point to emphasize on because if I, if i started emphasizing i need to repeat your whole lecture you have covered it very nicely uh, each and every corner so uh, thank you thank you lakshman it was very nice having you prati bhai thank you very much dr lakshmi strikande we look forward to you taking over as the chairperson of icug very soon later this year i'm sure the audience has been vastly benefited from your very elaborate talk starting from how to diagnose to all the way how to advise contraception in the postpartum period and prevent these women from being missed at any point of time during pregnancy i take great pride in introducing the next speaker dr archana patak can we have a cvf please minal and delighted to invite over 700 registrations for today's event and they are all waited breaths to listen but she has a post graduate from us a diploma in art and reproductive medicine from germany she practices as an obgyn and infertility specialist medical director of mdlm hospital and research center in ranchi and she is also an associate consultant at medica super specialty hospital in ranchi is a member of the safe motherhood committee of foxy which is headed by my dear friend dr preeti kumar from lucknow it secretary of ranchi obgyn society and she is also the editor of the rogs souvenir she has multiple areas of interest and uniquely she is the recipient of the charkhand social excellence award i take great pride in welcoming you to the amox platform ma'am looking forward to hear from you and your talk on progesterone it's relevant in pregnancy good afternoon everyone um, thank you amox uh, and the chronology committee uh, for this wonderful session and my special thanks to dr pratik tambe sir for uh, giving me this opportunity and allowing me to speak in midst of such stall words uh, now let's begin my topic is requesting you to please unmute please we unmute. can see your slides yes sir please go ahead. my topic is utility of progesterone in current practice i will be covering my uh, topic under the following heading uh, that is the brief introduction then therapeutic uses of progesterone in ops and gynae recent advances in clinical uses of progesterone non contraceptive uses of progesterone and research researches in progesterone now coming to the introduction as we all know that progesterone is an enigmatic but a feel good hormone and it is a progestational steroid ketone in pregnancy and its maintenance through its endocrine paracrine and immunological effects on fetal and maternal tissues on september 23 1929 billiard allen published the first paper on extracting progesterone from the corpus luteum Historically it was obtained from natural sources such as mexican yam and was used in contraceptive preparation in the mid 20th century the the progesterone is uh, secreted from the corpus luteum that is after the post ovulation and placenta from the second and third trimester a uh, small amount is secreted from the adrenal cortex and progesterone is an intermediate product in the formation of cortisol 
uh, in the uh, adrenal cortex and the ovary progesterone can be converted to androgens and estrogens and it is uh, metabolized rapidly by the liver 20% of it is excreted in the urine as sodium pregnant diol glucuronide now coming to the classification uh, progesterone can be further classified uh, based on their structure as we know that uh, uh, progesterone is orally inactive and it is metabolized in the liver so they are developed into the synthetic uh, progesterone and these are known as the progestin so these progestins are uh, further divided into the natural progesterone and 19 not testosterone now these uh, progesterone uh, 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 the progesterones uh, that are the natural progesterones they are associated with the estrogen and are given uh, in the hrt patient as they are associated with the estrogen then they counteract the risks of the endometrial carcinoma and in cases of 19 not testosterone it is also associated with the estrogen and it is given as a contraceptive pill uh, to the patients now coming to the administering progesterone uh, as we know that it is a oral route but the bioavailability is very less than the intravaginal route and the intramuscular route although several studies have shown that cycles in which vaginal progesterone was used had comparable outcomes to intramuscular progesterone in both fresh ivf and frozen embryo transfer cycles but uh, these synthetic progesterone they have some androgenic effects also they causes the fluid retention retention of cholesterol levels uh, headaches and mood disturbance and confusion there are some more side effects like edema abdominal bloating anxiety irritability depression and myalgia like uh, oral micronized progesterone uh, progesterone they have a decreased particle si size which enhances the dissolution and increases the half life it causes a reduction in the destruction Uh, in the gi tract and it causes a marked improved bioavailability and enhances the absorption two fold when the hormone is taken with the food when we do a comparison between the micronized progesterone versus the synthetic progestin we see a few side effects no effect on the mood no decrease in hdl cholesterol levels no adverse effect on the pregnancy outcome and when it is compared with the injectable progesterone also there is a maximal serum concentration achieved more rapidly but it also has few side effects like fatigue somnolence nausea bloating headache blurred vision mood swings and breast tenderness for the transvaginal progesterone if we see a minimal side systemic side effect and uh, uh, after few application of uh, this progesterone there is a progressive diffusion of progesterone from the cervix to the fundus of the uterus now coming to the therapeutic use of progesterone in the obstetrics as we know that progesterone decreases the maternal immune response to allow for the acceptance and implantation of the pregnancy it decreases the contractility of the uterine smooth muscle and maintains pregnancy till term when there is a drop in the progesterone level uh, then it facilitates the onset of the labor and it also inhibits the lactation during pregnancy and when there is a fall in progesterone then it triggers the milk production its role in pregnancy includes its use in luteal phase defect recurrent pregnancy loss preterm labor multiple pregnancy and assisted reproductive technique coming to the threat and abortion there are evidences of a reduction in the rate of spontaneous miscarriage with the use of progesterone when it is compared with placebo or no treatment in case of recurrent abortion three or more consecutive miscarriages four trials were done in 225 women in which the progesterone treatment showed a statistically significant decrease in miscarriage rate compared to placebo or no treatment in cases of preterm labor use of progestational agent result in a reduction of preterm delivery and an increase in birth weight the use of progestational agent may also reduce the frequency of uterine contraction prolong pregnancy and attenuate attenuate the shortening of the cervical length well there is a current recommendation from the society for maternal fetal medicine regarding the use of progestogens for the prevention of the preterm birth in single term pregnancy without prior spontaneous preterm birth and unknown or normal transvaginal ultrasonography with normal cervical length there is no evidence of effectiveness when single pair singletons with prior spontaneous preterm birth 
uh, 17P can be given uh, 250 milligram intramuscularly weekly from 16 uh, to 20 weeks until 36 weeks. And in singletons without prior spontaneous preterm birth, but where the cervical length is less than equal to 20 mm at less than equal to 24 weeks, then in this case, the vaginal progesterone 90 milligram gel or 200 milligram suppository daily from diagnosis of short cervical length until 36 weeks can be given. But in cases of multiple gestation, preterm uh, labor and PPROM, there is no evidence of effectiveness. Well, it uh, remains an object of debate whether universal cervical screening of singleton gestation without prior preterm birth for the prevention of preterm birth. But uh, currently, it cannot be universally mandated, but it is reasonable and can be considered by individual practitioners following strict guidelines. Now, coming to the therapeutic use of progesterone in gynec, as we all know that progesterone has a unique pharmacodynamics in the gyne gynecology. So now coming to the disorders of menstruation and ovulation, uh, in primary amenorrhea, priming with estrogen is essential. And in cases of secondary amenorrhea, progesterones may be given alone, but are usually combined with the estrogen. In cases of dysfunctional uterine bleeding, the continuous release of estrogen secretion unopposed by progesterone in an ovulatory cycle leads to endometrial hyperplasia, leading to menorrhagia or metrorrhagia or menometrorrhagia. Although used for all types of DUB, progesterones are chiefly indicated for an ovulatory bleeding and correction of endometrial hyperplasia. In spasmodic dysmenorrhea, the, when the progesterone is combined with the estrogen, it inhibits the ovulation and relieves the pain. But when it is given alone, it decreases the production of prostaglandin F2 alpha and vasopressin relieves the primary dysmenorrhea. In premenstrual syndrome, the trials did not show that progesterone is an effective treatment for PMS, nor that is not. Trial neither distinguished a subgroup of women who benefited nor examined claimed success with high doses. For the postponement, the combined oral contraceptive pills are being given and it is started three to six days before the expected onset of period and continue until the crisis is over. The flow is expected two or three days after the treatment is being suspended. But for the advancement, we start the treatment early in the cycle to suppress the ovulation, combined oral contraceptive pills, once daily from fifth day of the cycle and continued for 14th day. When it is suspended, the menstruation begins within two or three days. In cases of luteal phase defect, it is a uh, subtle disorder of corpus luteum function and has a multifactorial cause. The diagnosis is best made by measuring serum progesterone levels daily throughout the luteal phase. No reliable methods to diagnose the LPD and mid luteal serum progesterone between day 5 to 9 after ovulation less than 10 mg per ml. Progestin replacement has not been correlated with conception and treatment decisions mostly are empiric. So it is necessary to optimize the outcome of ART and HCG is not superior to the progesterone. HCG increases OHSS. So intramuscular progesterone, they also have some side effects like it is uh, painful, sterile uh, abscess is their allergic reaction needs to be administered by a nurse and oral progesterone is inferior to intramuscular or vaginal. So the micronized vaginal progesterone has solid evidence of effectiveness and convenience. Micronized progesterone capsules are most cost effective than progesterone gel and gel is at least four times more expensive than the capsules. For the fibrocystic disease, uh, after ruling out the breast cancer, the treatment is reassurance, painkillers, primrose oil, vitamin E, danazol, bromocryptine, diuretics, and pyridoxine. And if there is no relief, then progesterone therapy can be tried. Where uh, the cyclic administration of progesterone modulates the mammary effect of estrogen. For premenstrual mastalgia, when others' measures have failed, reassurance, a thorough clinical examination should be done in which the ultrasonography and mammography is there. Supportive therapies like uh, low caffeine and mild anti-inflammatory drugs are given. Hormone therapy in the form of uh, progesterone uh, and uh, bromocryptine, tamoxifen, danazol are given. And use of evening primrose oil, vitamin E and diuretics may also help.
in post menopausal women uh, when there is a intact uterus administration of estrogen may be accompanied by the administration of progesterone uh, it prevents the development of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer but in cases of hysterectomized women the addition of uh, progesterone to estrogen may also potentiate its effect in correcting osteoporosis in cases of endometriosis and pain combined oral contraceptive pills uh, progesterone uh, dinazol and uh, gnrh agonist they are equal in relieving pain associated with the endometriosis and we should prescribe the safest and the cheapest uh, combined oral contraceptives uh, ideally administered continuously should be considered as first line agents and administration of the progestin alone orally that is intramuscularly or subcutaneously may also be considered as the first line therapy contraceptions uh, progesterone only pill combined oral contraceptive iucd injectables then subdermal implants which causes cervical mucus hostile to spermatozoa and it uh, uh, makes the endometrium unreceptive to a fertilized ovum inhibit the ovulation in cases of pelvic, pelvic cancer uh, progesterone in large doses uh, and and endometrial carcinoma and its metastasis they uh, have a valuable adjuncts to surgery especially for the recurrent disease and in cases of adeno carcinoma of the vagina tube and ovary and for other types of malignant diseases of the uterine corpus there is less certain action now coming to the recent advances in clinical use of progesterone recent ocps they uh, contain the low doses of the estrogen and new progestins and because of the less androgenicity they do not cause much weight gain acne and hirsutism but uh, they do not and they do not also impair carbohydrate tolerance they also have a favorable lipoprotein profile and thus they protect against the cardiovascular disease but a who collaborative study has shown that 2.6 times greater risk of venous thromboembolism is there with the ocps containing uh, desogesterol and gestudine than the ocps containing levonorgestrel this influence may be due to some confounding factors like prescribing new progestins to smoker new users carriers of factor 5 latent mutation and women with family history of thrombosis now coming to the progesterone only contraceptives they are mostly given in women over 40 age 40 diabetics hypertension women and uh, women with the history of thromboembolism and uh, progesterone only pills containing not just estrogen or even not just estrogen are taken daily at the same time but new desogestrel they allow the progesterone only pill uh, 12 hour grace period and a greater ovulation inhibition another is Dep uh, deposub q provera uh 104 a new low dose deport medroxy progesterone acetate and it is being administered subcutaneously uh, subcutaneous dmpa showed uh, complete ovulation inhibition for 13 weeks along with the decrease in anemia pid ectopic pregnancy and endometrial cancer and benefit in the patients of sickle cell disease progesterone containing iucds like uh, mirena Uh, in which the lng um, levonorgestrel releasing intra uterine system lng ius contains 52 mg lng releasing 20 microgram day per day for 5 years and fibroplan which is a newer new shorter device releasing 14 microgram lng per day is being developed for the treatment of endometrial hyperplasia and menorrhagia in peri and post menopausal women now for the emergency contraception levonorgestrel alone in two doses of 0.25 mg which are 12 hr apart is bet is given and single dose of 1.5 mg can is equally effective postpartum contraception pops are can be a good choice after 3 weeks of postpartum now coming to the non contraceptive uses of progesterone it is used uh, it can be used uh, for the prevention of preterm uh, labor uh, in european trial for patients with short cervix less than 2 cm on tvs at 24 weeks with pres were prescribed 200 mg micronized progesterone vaginally up to 34 weeks of gestation it is also it can be also used for uh, luteal phase support during art uh, progesterone is a standard protocol for luteal phase support and can be given oral vaginal and through the intramuscular route 
Micronized natural progesterone, when given vaginally, is more effective than the oral route. In case of acne and hirsutism, rosperinone have shown the improvement and uh, 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 cip ciproterone acetate, uh, 50 to 100 milligram is added to first 10 days of the cycle with COCs in cases of severe hirsutism and acne. In cases of primary dysmenorrhea, extended regime of 84 days are effective in treating dysmenorrhea by decreasing the frequency of menses, vaginal ring, implant, and LNG IUS have demonstrated the reduction in dysmenorrheic symptoms. For the premenstrual tension or premenstrual dysmorphic disorders, drosperinone containing OCPs are observed to improve the water retention, behavioral changes, and mood swings. Drosperinone is an anti mineralocorticoid which is associated with the weight loss due to natriuretic action. In cases of abnormal uterine bleeding, progesterone are more effective. And uh, they th this is ideal in puberty, adolescent, and women approaching, approaching menopause. In cases of uterine fibroids, LNG IUS reduces menstrual blood loss and dysmenorrhea up to 50% in patients with the uterine fibroid. In endometriosis, uh, progesterone induces a hyperprogestogenic hypoestrogenic state, causing uh, decidualization of the endometrium. And progestins are the first choice for treatment of endometriosis because comparable effectiveness as dinosol or GNR GnRH analog. And LNG IUS has beneficial effects in the treatment of endometriosis by reducing pain, better suppression than the GnRH agonist with fewer side effects and providing ongoing contraception. Endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial carcinoma, the medical therapy depends upon the number of estrogen and progesterone receptors due to the local action on endometrium. LNG IUS is very effective in endometrial hyperplasia and menorrhagia. For the case of hormonal replacement therapy, progesterone in combination with the estrogen is used as an HRT for postmenopausal women whose uterus is present. Now coming to the recent researches in progesterone. It has a very effective role, uh, the role of progesterone in the breast cancer that pro proliferative changes in the breast cancers uh, cells are due to ovarian hormones as one third of the patients shows small response to the estrogen therapy, but some are um, unresponsive. unresponsive. So a special cell membrane protein TGRMC1 is found to block the cell death in breast cell, which is affected by progestins used in HRT. Role of progesterone in the brain injury. Progesterone increases neuronal survival and synthesis of myelin specific uh, proteins by oligodendrocytes. And uh, progesterone and 19 nor progesterone increases BCL2 express expression, preventing cell death. It has a very significant role in epilepsy as well. Uh, they interact with the several neurotransmitter receptors, GABA, glycine, serotonin-3, nicotinic cholinergic receptors, and progesterone has an uh, anti seizure effect due to its metabolite 3-alpha, 5-alpha, THP, and action at GABA receptor complex. It increases seizure uh, threshold and reduces epileptic form activity. Then role in stress, progesterone and uh, its uh, substitutes are neurosteroids, which regulate the catecholamine secretion during stress, and it modulates the reward system and improves the cognitive function. Role in the nicotine addiction is that progesterone inhibits the breakdown of serotonin and enhances the serotonin receptor functions in the brain. And people resort to nicotine-like substances that enhances the serotonin activity when progesterone levels are low. It has a significant role in the coronary hyperactivity since the low levels of progesterone can cause a decrease in the vascular thromboexin prostenoid receptors, causing coronary hyperactivity, which can cause coronary artery disease. And in, uh, it can be, uh, progesterone is also there in, uh, in a significant role in male contraception. Uh, it stimulates the calcium in, uh, increase, uh, seems to be related with the serum motility, uh, serum capacitation and biosynthesis of testosterone in the Leydig cells. Then role in el skin elasticity and bone density. Uh, skin 5 alpha reductase activity is inhibited by the uh, progesterone and 19 not derivatives. Topical 2% progesterone increases skin elasticity and firmness in peri and postmenopausal women.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Asana uh, Patak. I think I also learned a few new things that progesterone is important in stress, in epilepsy as well. So a lot of recent yeah, yeah. advances, I and that's why we that. have that's why we have youngsters and upcoming stars who come and address us at these events. So thank you very much for bringing those new points to our notice. Thank you. You had a wonderful program with four lovely talks and. Uh, at this stage, I must express apologies on behalf of Dr. Sudhata Dalvi. She had messaged me at the beginning of the program, but only now she's been able to communicate that she was actually dealing with a patient with PPH, which incidentally is actually the topic for today. The first two talks were on PPH and tackling metal mortality. Hopefully, her patient will come out of this and we wish her all the very best. We express apologies on her behalf for not being able to be here. Uh, Ajay Mani, sir, any closing remarks from you uh, before we take the questions from the audience? I think there are one or two only. We'll take those after we have comments. Uh, no, sir. All four lectures were uh, went very well, uh, up to mark uh, in all sense, an academic view and the practical point of view also. Uh, Dr. Archana, I just wanted to know, is there any difference between uh, the doses of progesterone in head injury or in uh, uh, that uh, other... Uh, new uh, avenues in male and female are the uh, are the same, sir. I think it is the same, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Great. You you have covered very uh, nicely all the aspect of progesterone. I we have you, heard it many times, but uh, it seems uh, your lecture is a bit different than others also. So thank congratulations thank you, sir. for the best lecture. And uh, Lakshmi Madam is uh, best as always. And uh, Pradesh sir has given basic uh, proper things about carbitocin and all the hydrotonics. Uh, so uh, great academic phase today. And thank you, Pratik Bhai, for that. Thank you, Dr. Ajay Manish, sir. There was one question, and I think that was regarding the issue of mob violence. And especially in the interiors, how do we tackle this particular issue? Now, I don't profess to be an expert in medical legal issues or an expert on PPH or maternal mortality in any way. But there were some key points which Dr. Vipin Chaka made in his talk, especially towards the end. And what he said is that you try and break the news slowly. Yeah. Try and talk to the relatives on multiple occasions. The person who is the most confident and who is the least the lead consultant should be the one who addresses this particular problem. And Another key point which he brought out is that don't rush to the police to report the death without actually having a pre-existing relationship. Now, in Mumbai, we have something called as the Police Shantata Samiti, which is actually an association of key opinion leaders from that particular area who are in constant liaison with the police, the stations and the officers in that particular territory. That's something which goes a long way towards tackling these kind of issues, unexpected sudden death, maternal mortality, sudden cardiac death. If you have something like a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or if you have a pulmonary embolism or even have maternal mortality because of PPH, which is unexpected, then having a pre-existing relationship with the police officers and the functionaries goes a long way towards tackling these issues. If for the first time you meet somebody who is in a position of power, who has the power to arrest you or to put you behind bars, when there is a maternal mortality, there is no way that person is going to help you. You may be right. You may have done nothing wrong. You may have treated the patient to the best of your ability. There is zero criminal negligence on your part. But if you meet that person for the first time, when there is a mortality or when there is a mob violence, Obviously, that person is not going to feel sympathetic towards you or go out of their way to try and help. So, always try and have good relations with your friends and colleagues, to people who are there in power. Make friends with people who are your local police officers. Go out of your way to try and send them messages, at least during festivals like Diwali, Dasra, Ganpati. Try and build bridges with them. If you have a relationship with them, then these are the people who will actually help you when there is a mob violence or there is a maternal mortality. 
especially when it is unexpected mortality where you don't have any criminal negligence on your dr jaymani sir your thoughts yeah correct sir as you as you told each and every point is correct we have to uh, in my lecture also i tell at the end of my lecture that have a good relation with the authorities and uh, authority means the police officers the junior police officer the mukhya is in the village as he asked this question or uh, she i think uh, she is uh, asking uh, so mukhyas then uh, the sarpanch and police party at the village level they must be in good liaison or good relation with you because they are the people who will prevent you from the mob violence they will explain each and everything to the uh, mob in their own language and they believe in those persons more than you and uh, you know, otherwise also if the police is on your side you are better protected and uh, truly uh, and properly told by you pratik sir thank you thank you thank you sir there is one question for dr lakshmi shikande ma'am and that is at what stage should we involve maybe an internal medicine person in the treatment for a woman who is diagnosed with diabetes in pregnancy should we have a multidisciplinary team approach or we are capable enough of treating patients who have gdm is it okay to go it alone uh, pratik in this era of uh, so many litigations and to be on safe side gdm is always a multidisciplinary approach because once your patient is on insulin we as gynecologists we are not capable of monitoring her insulin therapy so it is better that we involve and you have to involve your neonatologist from 28 weeks onwards the moment the baby becomes viable you have to have your neonatologist your fetal medicine specialist should be involved from the first trimester right from the at the scan of 11 to 13 weeks i see to it that my patient goes to a fetal medicine specialist to get that new uh, nt scan done at 11 to 13 weeks so you can understand that your multidisciplinary approach starts from the first antenatal visit itself and on the way you have to go on adding the endocrinologists the neonatologists the fetal medicine specialists from uh, day one and please don't forget to do fetal echo at 22 weeks and for these patients i will definitely recommend to do a maternal echo at 32 to 34 weeks of pregnancy so you have to involve a physician a cardiologist because in case she lands up with any problem after spontaneous delivery or if she needs a cesarean section better to have a cardiological fitness physician fitness and then proceed so you understand that it is a multidisciplinary approach including nutritionist ideally we should have a dietitian who can go on counseling her about the diet management so it is a multidisciplinary approach thank you ma'am i think that's a very clear cut message for the audience that any high risk pregnancy in today's world in 2022 where any sort of catastrophe can happen to the best of people in the best of hands even in tertiary care institutions complications can occur which may be unexpected involve like as many one, people pratik i would like to add one more point because yes, if you are anticipating any problem during delivery please see to it that you have one more colleague with you as a standby a qualified obstetrician not your standard sister ki okay i am doing practice with this sister since 20 years she knows how to do delivery of the patient no you should have a colleague who is equally competent and see to it that neonatologist is there to receive the baby and whenever you are doing cesarean section your anesthetist should be informed that this patient is a high risk pregnancy and a case of gdm so and okay. that cesarean section should also be done with a qualified equally competent obstetrician and not with any other person the assistant should be a obstetrician with you yes So the days of operating in small nursing homes with a nursing assistant oh, as your assistant, oh, operative oh, assistant, oh, are over. Over. Please don't do that anymore. Not, not also do not surgeons. Take that risk. Pratik, not also MS surgery is not an assistant for cesarean section. Please. Correct. Don't Absolutely. call surgeons for assisting you for cesarean section. Absolutely. Call equally competent obstetrician as your assistant. so very clear cut messages from our leaders that please don't take any extra responsibility on your shoulders don't invite trouble remember murphy's law 
even when you are best prepared the worst things can happen to you yes not that they should happen to anybody touch wood god forbid but being prepared and making sure that multiple levels of care are there multiple professionals are involved in care at various stages during pregnancy labor and thereafter is the best way to practice in today's world so i'll end with the official vote of thanks since we are at the end of today's program i'd like to express my gratitude to the amongst office bearers a newly installed president dr rajendra singh pardeshi sir this is the first program we are doing in his tenure our secretary of amongst dr sujatha dalvi apologies from her for being involved with the patient's care and therefore she could not log in today Dr Kiran Kurtakoti sir our vice president of amox Dr Ajay Mane vice president elect of foxy and also the joint secretary of amox now and Dr Mala Shivastav governing council member of icog apologies on her behalf i think she was also involved in a patient care and therefore she couldn't log in we had four wonderful speakers Dr Pardeshi sir spoke on preventing pph with carbitocin i think his clear cut message was that although we have achieved very good low maternal mortality rates i think after kerala maharashtra is now the second high second lowest in terms 38, of mmr 38. in this country and dr vipin chakar also gave us very important key practice points on how to handle maternal mortality both on table as well as in the hospital dr lakshmi shrikhande gave us a fantastic talk on hyperglycemia in pregnancy starting right from diagnosis and screening all the way up to insulin therapy and postpartum care and dr archana pathak spoke on utility of progesterone in current practice and gave us a lot of insight into newer recent advances including utility of progesterone in diseases which we normally don't tackle such as epilepsy and a lot of new advances regarding the newer formulations of progesterone thank you very much to all of you for sparing your precious time my gratitude also to science integra minal who is here subhu session who are there in the background always and to our academic partners torrent makers of ekbo sure devery sr and shelkalexty for being our academic partners for this series of key issues in obg1 thank you audience 700 plus of you who have logged in today i hope you have some good take home points on today's program and until next time goodbye god bless and we hope to see you very soon in the next one bye for now thank you thank you prateek thank, thank you bye thank you, bye. Thank thank you sir thank you doctors thank you. sir congratulations thank you, thank you minal thank you, you. minal thank you thank you thank you sir